This is the Battle XP G350, or the Battle XP? I don't know, Battle XP? I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce the name of this, but this is a rather fascinating device. This device arguably started out as a very cost competitive, budget friendly retro handheld device. It is using an older chipset that we've seen a lot in older handhelds that are two years plus old now. So, very quickly, let's go over the tech specs and get an understanding of what that actually means. So we do once again have the Rockchip 3326 SOC on this that has been used countless times. And likely this is what's getting us down to a very, very low cost on this device. One example that we can show as a benefit for using this older SOC is that there is a software maturity from the, the scene doing a bunch of work on this particular unit, trying to get the most out of it. So as a result, the type of operating system that you'll get on this is a very refined experience pinpointing exactly which type of emulators you're going to use. Lots of them will be using RetroArch, but others that demand more performance will be, will be very specific emulators. That's like Dreamcast, that's like N64, and that'll be, be those emulators will be used and tuned up specifically to make better use of this Rockchip 3326 device. So there is a benefit for using that older one outside of just getting a lower cost. There is another benefit that we're going to talk about, and that'll be later on. Going further into the tech specs, there is only a gigabyte of LPDDR3 RAM, which is fine for what we're going to be running on this device. The really nice part is how they're min-maxing everything. So we're using this 3.5-inch 640 by 40 IPS display. It's not unique or anything world-breaking, as we have seen similar types of displays, 3.5-inch, three, 3-inch, three 4-inch, uh, 640 by 40 IPS panels. This one looks fantastic. It has super minimal bezels, fits in the device. It is designed to a T, and there's lots to actually really like here. And that goes further into the build process of this. And the last thing I want to mention is that pretty much every variant that I've seen includes a 64 gigabyte micro SD card. Obviously, that can go up much higher, but that's what they include in the device. Now, there is a link in the description field below that will jump you over to taking a look at this device. There are tariffs and stuff going on right now, so just keep that in mind because I think that initially, is from especially because like my buddy Russ had a video that this was $35, and what I'm seeing right now is it's $47. So uh, there, the tariffs might be making things a little bit muddy right now with how uh, expensive these devices are going to get, but that's going to affect everything. So this is still going to be a lower cost option compared to everything else at the current time or as time goes on. So this is kind of a time capsule video. So just keep in mind that prices are going to fluctuate on this device and also availability. So with that out of the way, just keep that in mind when you're when you're looking up the, the Battle XP G350. When you boot up the device, the type of user experience that you should expect is very similar to other retro handouts as well. We are using Emulation Station. The skin they're using is something that I would call something like a minimalist glossy. I actually really like it, so it's a very clean type of text that has this reflective surface on the bottom. I'm a big fan of it, and you can just jump straight into any one of those emulators that are there that'll be showing for the types of ROMs that are already included in that 64 gigabyte micro SD card. So jumping through, there is a handful of games that are already there. So if you just wanted to get straight into it and start playing, you totally can without having to go ahead and put your own ROMs on this device. Overall, this type of user experience, I think, is fairly straightforward. And it's just a simple front end to jump you into either RetroArch that has a bunch of cores running that are for a number of different emulators, or it will jump you into a very specific emulator like Fly Flycast or another N64 emulator so that that would be very specific. All of the hotkeys try to match between all of these different engines that are actually running in the background. So they do try to get that re working reasonably well. However, some of it isn't fully baked. Uh, well, I'd say that, but most of it's there. There is just one problem, like in the vertical arcade section, none of the directional pad is actually mapped correctly. So it's still mapped as if the D-pad was down and up. So that has to get reversed. So you just make sure that you do that because at least in how I had it, it was not set up correctly. So if, if you actually wanted to play like that, that's gonna need to get fixed. If you don't, then no big deal. Everything else is just going to work pretty much just fine. And all the hotkeys for like fast forward, uh, save, load, more or less all of those are quite similar. Outside of that, there may be a toggle difference between like holding down the function key and pressing start to exit out of an emulator if it is not using RetroArch specifically. So just keep that in mind as a user experience side of what to expect. It's a rather straightforward front end using emulation station. So I don't think it should be outside the wheelhouse of what anyone already knows how to use. Now, because it's using RetroArch, by default, what it tries to do is basically stretch out the screen to everything, which is not ideal for a lot of different use cases. Now, a lot of different emulators that are already prepackaged in there fit closer to that 4x3, 640x480 
uh, aspect ratio that is on the display itself. Not everything will fit into there perfectly. GBA, for example, is going to be three by two. So you would want to put that into its own aspect ratio. It doesn't lose all that much. You just get some letterboxing going on, which isn't terrible. And for what it, for the end result, I would much prefer just to have the core aspect ratio. There are going to be instances where that is not a perfect solution and you will want to fudge with it a little bit more. Sometimes for like Game Boy, if you wanted to have, if you see some scaling issues where things are just wobbly, what th one thing that's often easy to see is the Mega Man health bar. So you would want to use something like integer scaling. And again, all of this is available uh, very quickly in RetroArch settings itself. So it's not really hard. And again, I'm showing you in the video how you can get to it. You can just play around with it, or you could just go to like Retro Game Core's guides because he has a zillion of them. So he can be able to help you, guide you through there if you have any particular questions. We also have a little bit of horsepower to actually use some shaders. So if you wanted to use some CRT shaders of varying degrees, maybe ones that just have a mask or some that will bow the screen a bit along the corners just to give you uh, an effect that you're looking for, you can actually do those without any particular performance hit or a great enough performance hit that the SOC can handle itself. So everything, all the shaders that they prepackage in there on the RetroArch side, pretty much are validated to work and operate on the Rockchip 3326 and are decent enough. Last bit to talk about that I find important would be standby. Uh, this works as you would expect it to. So you just press tap the power button and it will sleep the machine, pressing the power button again and the system wakes back up exactly where it left off with very little battery use while in standby. So this works as you would imagine it to work. I didn't have any particular problems. I had this device for over a week now. I've been fiddling around with it, taking it to work with me and using standby and, and evaluating the battery usage uh, between states. And it was fine in my usage. So that's pretty much what you can expect out of the user experience side. When we take a look at the types of experiences that you can expect out of this. Now, again, all of the very older stuff like uh, Game Boy or Game Boy Color, all of these play just fine and look really good on the display. In the same Game Boy segment, if we start going into Game Boy Advance, it's, it can easily handle Game Boy Advance games, pretty much every one of them. I don't think you're going to have much of a trouble finding anything that doesn't work. I would just, again, suggest going to that 3 by 2 aspect ratio because it will force a full scaling, which I do not find appealing myself. But if you like that, then you don't have anything to change at all. When talking about the older home consoles, starting with like the Nintendo Entertainment System, that obviously plays just fine and moving up to the next generation for Genesis or Super Nintendo or even Turbo Graphics, and then their counterparts, right? So you could do Turbo Graphics 16, the CD version, or even Sega CD, right? So all of the CD versions of those will work just fine. As we go up to the next generation of consoles, this is where things are going to start breaking down a little bit. So PlayStation 1 emulation works just fine on this, and I think that is a stellar example for this particular handheld. Also fits very well in the 4x3 aspect ratio, and tons of PlayStation games run perfect on here. When looking at Sega Saturn, that is actually an exceedingly difficult emulator to run on the Rockchip 3326 devices. So don't expect a lot of games to be fully playable here. There are going to be a few that do play well, but there are going to be a lot that are going to be not the best experience. Last but certainly not least would be N64 emulation. And it finds itself somewhere between the PlayStation and Sega Saturn in terms of difficulty of being able to emulate games, especially on the Rockchip 3326. Now, the emulator that they're using and how tuned up it is is actually quite impressive what they're able to achieve out of the Rockchip 3326. Now, you will find it creaking and moaning as it's trying to actually emulate N64 games. And you're not going to have a perfect experience for every particular game. But even for F-Zero GX and how fluid it is, it is rather impressive, even though prior to getting to the scene, you'll hear pops and stutters. So anticipate not the best experience for N64, but certainly better than Sega Saturn. And that would kind of round out this particular generation. The next generation, the only thing that we have really is PSP and Dreamcast and Nintendo DS. And that's kind of a weird hodgepodge of emulators that would be available. Even using the analog sticks as the, the virtual stylus and pressing down, all that works as you would expect it. Swapping between screens for the three and a half inch four by three display is fine and looks great when you're actually playing games. So I think it's actually a worthwhile experience for doing Nintendo DS emulation in a pinch. If you actually wanted to play Nintendo DS on this particular device, I would not recommend it 
for this particular handheld just because of the the device itself i would just really suggest getting a ds or a 3ds and modifying that to be able to play on it because i think that's just going to be overall a better experience but that's just me if you want to have be able to play games in any particular device this also works as well psp is also an interesting area where we see that games are playable now not every psp game is going to be very playable on this device but a large percentage will the bigger problem is that the psp has such a wide aspect ratio that you're going to get some intense letterboxing with this small screen it works and can display just fine i just don't really recommend it for playing on here it, it, you can play it and we do have analog sticks as well so it's totally available and something you can do i just don't recommend it for this particular device just because of the aspect ratio and then the other part of this like higher end generation of that we're going to be able to play is Dreamcast emulation. Now, again, not every Dreamcast game is going to work perfectly here, but a large amount will. Flycast is a very good emulator and the system th that the Dreamcast has is actually a far more straightforward system, which is kind of entertaining, right? Because the Dreamcast is far more powerful than the Sega Saturn was and the Sega Saturn is hard to emulate. It's just a bunch of uh, parallel processing that the Sega Saturn has. So that's pretty much the emulation experience that you can expect out of the Battle XP G350. There are other things you can do. You can do game ports and you can also do Pico 8. Pico 8 is awesome. I would really, really suggest taking a look at a bunch of different Pico 8 games. They are really fun to play, really honed experiences. I don't think that they're very long, but what you get out of them is something truly special. So don't sleep on Pico 8 games. The included set that they have on the micro SD card that they provided it, it is a really good showcase and example. So definitely take a look at that. Outside of home consoles, we also do have arcade emulation. So you still will be able to play that. One thing that I would like to highlight for this particular segment is that the D-pad is just exceptionally well done. Almost so that I, it feels like this is a D-pad that Ambernick has done because it feels very close to what Ambernick has done, but it's just really, really good. So they really nailed the D-pad on this. The analog sticks are also okay. They're a little bit flighty. They're a very high sensitivity, not the best, but for how many games are you going to be playing on it? I think it serves its purpose of what you're looking to get out of it. The D-pad and face buttons and the triggers really, really well designed, especially for such a budget friendly device. Overall, the build quality on this device kind of matches everything else that we've seen from it. It has this very high degree of polish, which is odd for something that is so budget friendly. You would anticipate it being kind of lackluster in build materials and how good the D-pad is and how good the display is and how good the software experience is. And using all of those older components with the latest generation of tooling that they have available to them from, uh, from their manufacturing side, it kind of shows how much better they can do today than they were able to do just two years ago. So really fascinating to see how good this device can be using older chipsets. What this oil boils down to is that if you're looking for a Game Boy Form Factor device that has all the buttons that you're looking for, a very nice display while not uh, occupying large bezels, having really good buttons and controls, the analog sticks are so-so, but they are functioning just fine for the types of stuff that you need. So everything that you would hope for to do while having really excellent build quality and still being exceedingly cost conscious, it ticks off a lot of boxes. So if you were looking for something that was as cheap as possible while also trying to maximize the value of your dollar, this is a device that you should have very high on your list. Thank you very much to my YouTube channel members as well as my Patreon members. Your support really means the world to me, guys. I hope this video was informative. As always, guys, thank you for your time and thanks for watching.